It's not a bird, it's not a plane, it's superhero slate. It's a modern podcast where we talk about everything that's great. Like movies, TV, superheroes. It's superhero slate. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Superhero Slate, the show where we run down the latest superhero entertainment news. We love TV, movies, and superheroes, so let's talk it all out. My name is Chris Dillard. And my name is Mike Royer. And welcome to the official Superhero Slate review of Avatar, The Way of Water. Yes, and I'd like to hope people listen to podcasts and listen to us over the last nine years because we're real people with real lives who... Mm -hmm. You know, love to go to the movie theaters and then kind of come here once a week and download our thoughts out onto the internet. But as that's being said, we are real people, and yep. I just had like an exhausting. My, two Mike hours. is not bringing his A game on this, is what, what he's trying to say. It's not his. It's no one's fault. He, he's he's had a, he's had some oh trials and tribulations here. Yeah, she was just a it's a bit of a home improvement uh, nightmare for two hours, and we kept, I kept pushing off the podcast. I was like, Chris, I'll be ready at four. I was like, uh, give me twenty more minutes. Uh, I think I need ten more minutes, and then and then eventually I just ended I ended up giving you like an indeterminate amount of time. I was like, mm -hmm. I don't no this is a video of what i'm doing uh you use your best judgment to determine how long it's going to take me to get on the microphone yeah. with that being said all of my work uh ended up uh being a disaster and it didn't work i had to scrap it and there's nothing worse than like cleaning up after a project and it just didn't work because you have nothing to show for all the mm. dust that you're sweeping. Yeah, so yeah. that being that being said, I feel like I'm um, I'm 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 geared up right now. Like I well, got a lot of so I got a lot of ire behind me. But it, we 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 kind of already let the let the um, yeah. Well, I think we, you, you're we, making let the lid slip of what kind of how we feel about the movie yesterday yeah. when we recorded the news. I think you are are making a great segue into this Avatar uh, review because originally, and we've talked about this on the show. Uh, our, our regular superhero slate news podcast that James Cameron originally wrote a treatment for the second movie and scrapped it has nothing to show for it Mike so I think you know much like James Cameron you you are much like him today in, in uh, what he did with the original I, Avatar 2 script I I love that I will I will channel I will channel that and hopefully the second attempt at this project will turn out to be in um, high resolution IMAX when, <laughs> screen quality in my garage. <laughs> when, when you do it, I want it to be in 3D. And I don't want the newest 3D. I don't want passive 3D. Mike. I want the red and blue stuff. So whatever you do, make sure it's in red and blue. So we can you can see it coming, coming right at us here. But yeah, so we have both... Um, watched Avatar The Way of Water. Again, as we talked about on a regular show, I am sitting on this uh, from opening weekend. You are from this weekend. And I will say um, there was a legendary, I guess, quote unquote, um, box office for this movie this weekend because it had a 0% drop from week two to three in wow, box office returns. That, that's that's impressive. You don't get that headline often. Yeah, especially, um, you know, you know they, they were complaining about Spider-Man. Um, I think No Way Home, which was last year, and it had a, a pretty significant drop after the holidays. But you know, at the same time, you know, um, I, I I don't know how I don't know how many people are going back to rewatch Avatar: The Way of Water, but a lot of people are going the first time. And you know, um, as we talked about, it seems like it's going to have some some legs to it, right? When you have a zero percent drop in week three, it's probably going to continue for for a couple more weeks and the only competition i know and i i didn't think it had any but there's that megan movie with a creepy doll coming mm -hmm. out um soon um so i don't think that'll eat into it i think it's a different audience but i think we can probably go all the way up to february writing that number one slot for a while yeah and you sent me a great chart from the the website the numbers which uh tracks the uh, first movie alongside of the sequel of Way of Water. And it's just a domestic chart, right? So I don't have the worldwide comparison on here. But it shows that the uh, sequel is trending day-to-day uh, -day above the original Avatar. Now, there is a ta toggle on this website which will turn on like the uh, actual inflation. inflation adjusted. And if you do that, it it's running like neck and neck. It's almost performing identical to the yep. original Avatar. But that being said, no one out there is ever going to report actual 
inflation adjusted numbers. Like right. the studio is never going to do that. And the blogs and other websites are never going to do that as well. And all movies are like that. So it's important to note that as these box office numbers are reported, uh, they're never going to include inflation unless you kind of go to like a niche news website or mm-hmm. podcast where they're really analyzing the numbers. So if you were to look at the domestic numbers as of right now, uh, Way of Water is overperforming. Uh, now, I don't know about the international numbers. And also, I believe Chinese New Year is coming up soon. It, and it, it, it's it, like February. It, it's, yeah. not, it's not any time, I, I think, within the next month, though. Well, I, it's big enough to look out for, right? Yeah. Because that is a huge, uh, very long holiday compared to just yeah. like one day or one weekend here in the United States where like the whole... Uh, country is going to be on vacation. So I don't know if a way of water is going to be something that they want to go to, or if it's going to be maybe, you know, uh, more of a domestic Chinese release that they would prefer to see. Cause I know a lot of domestic Chinese movies save their release for Chinese new year. So it, it still has more money in front of it. It seems to have legs as they like to say. So I think mm-hmm. the, this whole it- narrative that was being formed, that this movie is going to underperform and, you know, uh, the Navi are, are dead out there in the pop culture did not end up happening. Well, and I, I think the, as with any sequel, I think it also, you don't have to reintroduce the world. Right. And I think this movie, um, doesn't, it, it actually, I think does a poor job reintroducing us to this world, um, with a couple things. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into it. But like, um, people already know what it is, right? We don't need to understand what Pandora or is it the RDA? Is that the name of the, the agency who's I, coming I, for I them? Think, I think so. I think a theme oh, yeah, of it's this review yeah. is that I don't remember names of organizations or people. Yeah. I have like all, I, I literally Googled way of water characters and Google has like this nice little uh, thumbnail a search return of pictures and names because I I don't know them. This is a new oh, yeah. this is a new language here to uh, us us Earth, us Earth people, and uh, we'll see how I struggle with that. <laughs> yeah, and and um the uh I guess the thing is also with with that there is very little RDA in this movie, right? I think like the humans take a backseat to uh, the two cultural differences of the not the the navi right there's the the jungle slash tree navi uh the what i will call the earth nation navi and the water nation navi um who um honestly i mean it look look, look cool as hell i, I think that's, that's that's really fun uh for this but the other thing i think is i'm just gonna go ahead and throw this out there movies of original ips such as avatar not based on anything other than an idea james cameron had this is fantastic news, right, for original IP movies. Like, uh-huh. everything else, like, we're always talking about Marvel movies, DC movies, adaptations, you know. Um, this is great for original content, and that's, that's something we just don't get to see a lot these days. It's something new and fresh from from the idea of a, a filmmaker. So, um, yeah, we I, never I do quite got that. a Yeah, we never got a sequel to things like uh, Jupiter Ascending. I'm just trying to think of just... Mm-hmm. I think that was an ad- I think that was an adaptation as well, but like was it okay? Yeah, Never yeah. mind that. Yeah, well, I mean, but like, yeah, like you know, I think that we haven't had something like this what since maybe Star Wars, right? Like you know, um, in terms of numbers, I, I don't think. Again, I, I I go to the store and I check the toy aisles. I don't see a lot of Avatar toys out there. Uh, that doesn't mm-hmm. mean there's not, but I don't think it's also like you know the the, the secondary market, the residuals from like action figures and stuff like that, it just must not be there for this, but. They don't need it when they're literally just selling literally a movie going experience, and that is something um, that we can you know jump into here is our movie going experience for this, right? Like some, like you said, especially we love to go to the theater. We love that whole the whole vibe. Even though I know you hate the smell of jalapenos, like the open <laughs> jar of jalapenos. You, you, if you went there and didn't have it, I know you'd probably be a little disappointed if you're like, well, they took jalapenos out of the theaters. Um, because that's part of it, right? All the goods, the bads, we've, we've had it, the whole thing. And I would say um, this is probably one of the better, um, less bothersome movie-going experiences I've had in a while uh, at, at the end of the day, right? Um, to, to watch the movie and, and not have um, people on their phones or like talking or interrupting for the whole movie. And, yeah. and, and that was really cool. 
Yeah, on that, I would say it. this does feel like a moment, right? As compared to, you know, we get Marvel movies two or three times a year now, and they're very, um, it seems like your mom, your grandma, all the kids come out to this one. I'm not, I'm not saying that's not necessarily happening with Avatar. It actually factually has to happen in order for it to get these box office numbers. But it seems like almost people are just like, okay, this is something unique happening here that only comes along like what, every 12 years it, it, it seems mm-hmm. to. Uh, uh, so yeah, I would say the same thing. Uh, my theater had like this vibe of just like, okay, we're ready for this. This is this is more special than anything else we'd see in the movie theater. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, to t- kind of cap off what I talked about yesterday, I was actually uh, lucky enough to be in Florida, Orlando, and go to one of thirteen AMC theaters that have a laser projector. Um, so I did not have the IMAX experience. I did not do three D because I can't do it very well. Um, with I'm, I'm legally blind in one eye and 3D doesn't sit well with me. But they do have heated seats and they will deliver food right to your seat for you if you order it at the uh, the um, concession stand so you don't have to wait in line for everything. Nice. It make everything. So that was really fun. I will say the laser projector uh, could not tell you a difference between that and my home theater projector, if I'm going to be honest at the end of the day. I, I think there was nothing special that stood out that made me feel like I'm watching something different from a projector. So... If you ever have the opportunity, I can't say I recommend it. I don't think it's an extra cost, but like if you want to check it out, I think you're going to be underwhelmed by laser and yeah. AMC at the end well, of the day. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, what is a laser, a laser except for light? <laughs> so, yeah. And that is basically a projector. Yeah. So I don't even know what the benefit is to a laser projector. It's, it's, it almost seems like it would be like either the longevity of the device or possibly maybe the length of projection. Like maybe you could set the projector back well, further. So it seems like to the audience, it's just kind of like a branding type no, of thing to give it a little extra zhuzh. Well, well, the lasers, they have different lightings. Lasers is more like an HDR kind of thing, right? For, for projectors because other ones are bulb powered, right? So you just have the lumens of a bulb. With laser, you can do, like, you can control the light more because it's not just one bulb coming out. You have multiple, like, beams coming out of this thing. Kind of like, again, at Disney, how they light up the castles, right, with the laser uh, projector. So they can control it better. So you're supposed to get, like, more, like, higher or brighter brights, darker darks, and, and, and all this crystal clear stuff. But I couldn't tell it. It got any difference <laughs> at the end of the day. So thankfully, it was not an extra premium. But, you know, I, I, I'm glad to say I did it. Heated seats made it nice for three and a, three three hours and fifteen minutes, um, and whatever. How I think we had like thirty minutes of trailers before the movie started too. I don't know about you, but like, I was in that theater for a long time that day, uh, waiting for this movie to start and, and watch it. Um, but uh, over, overall, fun, fun time. And you saw it. Uh, you you don't normally go to the IMAX. Um, de- where where you went, right? So this yes, was, this was I, a rarity for yeah, you. I, I, I have a feeling that I saw the movie as James Cameron intended. I was at a a 3D IMAX screen, like an actual true IMAX. Well, I guess there's lots of different definitions of IMAX, right? I always assume IMAX in my brain is I go to the Natural History Museum and they're doing the 3D showing of like Everest or whatever and you're looking at like a gigantic dome like at um like at, like you know one of those big dome ceilings that's what IMAX is to me but that it stopped being that a long time ago and now it's just kind of like a really really tall 4x3 screen so I believe I saw it as the director wanted me to. And I I picked pretty decent seats because the last time I was in this theater is when I saw Infinity War and I was a little too close to the screen than I wanted to be and a little off to the side. So I was like smack dab in the middle of the audience, um, both vertical and horizontal. So I felt like my seats were really, really good. But man, these IMAX screens, they stuff you in there like sardines. Like once everybody is settled in your row, uh, God... uh, God give you strength if you decide to exit that row to use the bathroom, which I don't know how you sit down for, you know, with the trailers, you know, almost four hours probably without needing to use the bathroom at least once. Uh, You pretty much should plan as this being the only thing that you do all day and it's the first thing that you do. Don't consume any matter or fluids if you want to watch this movie in a proper IMAX screen because I had to get up once and everybody hated me because like it depending on how tall you are it doesn't matter how much you like pull your knees back you like physically have to stand up to let me through. So that was the only thing that kind of sucked is that I had I was really really stressed planning when I was going to interrupt everybody in the theater so I could 
to go use the bathroom. And then you got to do it all over again when you come back in. So I tried to go to the bathroom as quick as possible. So it's like ripping off a mm-hmm. Band-Aid so these people wouldn't get too subtle back into the movie. So that being said... Uh, this theater looked beautiful. I guess we can uh, go ahead and maybe start dropping our spoiler-free review mm. here of Avatar The Way of Water. And for me, it was an absolutely beautiful experience. I've never visually seen a better-looking movie. I, and I'm including, like, the best-looking Star Wars movies, the best, like, uh, Avengers or even, like, DC movies out there. Like, visually, this thing is just every frame has, like, love and care and attention points into it and I I think that's special in a way because most of the time I'm somebody that comes from the point of view that like story is everything it doesn't matter how bad your movie looks you could be you could be working off of an indie budget right but as long as your story's good I will I will overlook any anything bad because I'm having a good time engrossed in the story Uh, this is almost the opposite in a way of James Cameron gave me visually the best Best looking thing I've ever seen in my mm-hmm. entire life on the screen and then the story just ends up being you know okay I thought I was more entertained and immersed than I was in the first one uh, so I think that's good that's good progress but like man you kind of think you would get used to it right after being in the theater for over three hours that you would just kind of get numb to the 3d to the dimensions on the screen to the fidelity of the characters but man like e- every new action set piece every new location just reinvigorates like just the absolute like thrill you're having watching this movie so um, yeah I think when we jump into spoilers we'll kind of split this review up into like the technology visual side of things and uh, you know we'll we'll also talk about the story a little bit separately but they got so many different things going on here the three dimensions the high fidelity of the CGI the different frame rates which I, I don't know I don't know Chris I don't know about you but was it ever advertised to you did you ever see anything yeah i never saw anything i had no idea there was going to be an alteration to the frame rates in any different scenes of this movie so when it happened at first i was like whoa what what the hell's going on here I, i was not prepared for this i've never done this before right you know i never went and saw the peter jackson hobbits and was it 40 frames per second or 30 frames well, per yeah, second? Well, yeah, yeah, they, they did the 48. They did the double the 24. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, don't, so I just had never experienced before. So it was a lot of first for me in this movie. So overall, easy to recommend, yeah. right? Because because even if you have, like, you know, a friend or a family member that just, like, doesn't care about movies, right, and they're just looking for something to turn their brain off, all they watch is the Kardashians, right? You know, you have, like, the mm-hmm. perfect uh, sample person that just does not care about what they're watching. They just want to be visually entertained. Like, yeah, bring them along. They're going to have a great time. Uh, and I think even if you have, like, a super film snob uh, friend, they're going to have a great time, too, because they can appreciate the visuals. And uh, this is just – it's very easy to recommend. I'm very excited for more Avatar in the future. So, mm-hmm. uh, Chris, what, what did you think about Avatar? I, I, I lean into visuals does not a good film make uh, at the end of the day. I think, I, think it's, I think it's beautiful. They've worked on this movie for five years. I, I, I think I don't say it's the best movie we've ever seen like visually, but like I, I do it's up there. I can't, I can't disagree. At no point did I think, oh, my gosh. I'm watching someone be mocapped, right? Like this is when you mentioned Avengers. I'm like, it's, it's similar to like Thanos, right? In in the Avengers movie, you never once think, oh, that's that's Josh Brolin wearing you know a Thanos thing on his head, like with the dots. Like everything looks absolutely fabulous. Um, you know, even even the water stuff, which you know, I know you're not a big fan of underwater scenes, right? We've talked about that in some other movies. Um, so I'm I'm, I'm excited to get your opinion on those because a lot of this movie is set in water, underwater, um, uh, for this whole thing. I, I think, yeah, I think honestly it, it, it was fun to be there to experience the, again, a, a, a very large screen in the cinema, the, the audio sounds that you're supposed to, uh, just being in, um, I guess, a I wouldn't say communal, but like, a, you know, you're, you're watching a movie with some, with everybody else and you're, you're just kind of what let it wash over you, uh, pun intended, I guess, with the way of water and, and experience it. Uh, I think that again. I, I think I agree with you. The story is a little light in things, but I think if I was to do anything, this I would just say: if you don't want to watch this whole movie, go to the last hour. Right? Uh, like the there is very much. This is movie is split in like three sections. 
the last section involves the essentially the um, conflict of the movie, uh, and I'm pretty sure it's just one big one big scene, right? Like it just starts and doesn't stop uh, for like the last hour, and that is absolutely phenomenal to, to to see on on here and it really you know brings part of like you mentioned the the pandora the world of pandora the um the different you know the the natives the the navi uh you know the the jungle ones the water ones the um the rda everything kind of culminates in this this last hour long piece here of this three hour movie and and it, it, it was really it was i i i can't say i'm not being harsh on this movie i just don't think it i'm not gonna put it on a pedestal but i really enjoyed watching it and i i honestly and i think you you may i don't know if you agree or not, this is better i would hold this above the first one right in terms of like sequels doing better mm-hmm. than the original so you know james cameron is known to do that with both of his terminator movies right everyone likes terminator 2 more than like his uh, the terminator's good but everyone loves terminator 2 avatar good a lot of people are liking avatar the way of water a little better so um, and I, I think to me it's just because I, I, I feel the the overall – there's a lot more characters to be invested in here, right? It, it is truly a sequel in terms of like Vin Diesel should have been in this movie because it's all about family. Uh, I, I think you <laughs> might have mentioned that yesterday. Uh, so like it, it's all about family. The characters here, it's not um, – you're not being introduced to the to the Navi and their culture. You're you're being introduced to, I guess, another set of Navi and their culture, but from the point of the Navi rather than, um, you know, the the humans in like trying to become part of the Navi to steal their unobtainium, if you will. And this movie dives into another, um, I guess, MacGuffin, if you will, uh, that um, that people want to get, and it, it affects the the water navi in in that regards but i you know overall i I mean there are like i said at no point did i ever question any of the cgi or any of the effects or say hey this is just a person mode capping this this scene it all felt real i don't know i've I've got again i I know you've got do you have imdb or wikipedia pulled up for this movie like uh Uh uh, because i'm pulling up uh, sam worthington when was his last movie (laughs) um I, i i'm looking here he's got some that he's done here or there but like I can't think of a movie he's done since, uh, I guess, Wrath of the Titans. Um, he did back right after um, kind of Avatar. Uh, well, think started... about it this way. If you are, if he was lucky enough to participate in the box office of the right. first Avatar in any uh, significant way, right. well, he does not need to look for another thing to do. Well, well he, he was in everything for like four years, and I was like, okay. Uh, that's great, and then he does nothing. But like at the same time, he's not like an actor. Like oh, he he was rusty or he he sucked. Like he did a really good job in this one as well, playing um, Jake Sully or what, whatever the I can't say it, whatever his nickname is of um, the he's like the the warrior of the of the Navi who who beat the beat the RDA the first time. Oh, so who the the chief or whatever I don't know I don't know what the name. Yeah, is. Well, he's got he's got like a special name. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, we're, you're probably a little more, more hotter than I am. I'm not cold by any means. Um, uh, but I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the, um, like I said, the, what we have the two parts, right? The visuals, the, the, the things that we experience while watching it and then the story in itself. So which one do you want to jump into first? Cause I honestly well, uh, think there's no spoilers for this movie. Like nothing about this. I feel is spoiled other than like certain se- well, like telling what scenes are, but I, I'm going to mark the yeah. spoilers right now. Well, I feel like I'm geared up a little bit on the, the story elements right now. So okay. let's jump into the story overall for this movie. Jump on the spoilers right now, warning everybody. When I was watching this film, to me it felt like I was watching three episodes of like the, yep. the best-looking HBO show of all time. So like 60-minute episodes in a row to the point where I got so engrossed so early on in the movie – of the clone version of the bad guy from the first movie coming back and yep. he's hunting down Jake Sully and they're still in the forests, right? And we're being introduced to the kids and, you know, how some humans are still left behind and how there's the spider kid running around. I honestly... His name's Spider, by the way. He's not yeah. an actual spider person, but yeah. <laughs> there, there was a brief moment in the movie where I forgot, like, oh, yeah, they're supposed to go to the beach at some point yeah. in time, right? Yeah. I totally forgot. And then that's kind of where I felt like, oh, Oh, the first episode of this three-part miniseries, right, well, is just them, like, setting everything up, right? It's the stakes of the villain coming back, Sigourney Weaver's 
immaculate clone conception mm-hmm. being part of the family you know just getting everything in line what's happened between the first movie and this movie and yeah. then all of a sudden the humans coming back it was a little jarring right i kind of thought maybe we'd get a little bit more of the human side of things yes. right like yep. like I, i'm hoping at some point in time in one of these five movies we get to visit earth so maybe you, you, maybe not for a you, maybe not for like a whole you, like portion but I just want to see what Earth looks you are, like. Right? The, one of the producers, I think John Landau says, like, I think in movie four or five, they even have Neytiri going to Earth. Like, a oh. whole, a whole like, taking the people, some of the people to Earth for that. Oh, so, yes. maybe kidnapped or something like that. Yeah. Because I want to see a little bit more because I totally understand the motivation of these humans. And if this movie is doing anything right on the line perfectly is I would hundred percent believe this is what the human race would do if we found another planet, right? We would absolutely do everything that these bad guys are doing in this movie. We would show up, we would do the same playbook that colonizers have been doing on earth, you know, for the, for like the last like thousand years or whatever. So I, it felt very believable. This is how it would go down. And even when you see the very intense kind of wailing scene mm-hmm. in the movie, like just it just seems like so like James Cameron knows what he's talking about, right? You know, he was like, I am obsessed with the ocean and diving deep. So, so even when he does these moments and set pieces, like I'm just like looking at the bridge, I'm looking at railings on this boat, and I'm just like, oh, James Cameron it- knows exactly what the railing of a boat looks like. He knows theoretically how you would hunt this yeah, alien and, whale on an alien planet it's like it's so meticulous and like well crafted it's, it, it's so fascinating yeah, to watch it, it felt more like an actual educational segment than a part of a movie right like you're not yeah. watching it it is of course an action piece when they're doing the whaling but it felt more educational because also he has a character uh i played played by um oh jermaine clement right like telling mm-hmm. us what's going on like explaining to Spider, like you know the the human part part of this, uh, while while it's going on. So, um, yeah, hundred hundred percent. You know, it, he is very everything underwater was was very thought through and 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 done well, right? Um, you know, yeah. v- very much from the start to the end. I will say, in terms of story parts, there there to me there are three parts. Um, mm-hmm. with a, a a prologue, the the first twenty minutes or so, I was like. I almost walked out of the movie because I'm like, this is the <laughs> stupidest prologue I've ever seen to a movie, right? Like, like, hey, you know, I'm Jake Sully, and this is my life. We've had these number of kids in this number of time, and uh, you know, it, it just like it just kept jumping through things very quickly. I'm like, this is way too fast for a movie to be moving that you know that's this long. Like, I hope the whole movie isn't just like small four minute segments that are just like and then we we time jump and then we time jump like. When the, when the humans came back, right, they're like, after, you know, after, what was it, 15 years or something, they came back. However the oldest son is, uh, they, they came back, and, like, it lands, and, it, like, it burns a huge crater in the ground. And I'm like, this isn't what I wanted to see with the humans coming back. This this kind of sucks. Like, this, it's not very fun, uh, you right? Like, but by the time the prologue got done, I was able to get more into this movie, um, right? Like, once they go and, like, hey, you know, we're doing some, we're, we're doing guerrilla tactics against this. Oh, they, they, we know they're hunting for Jake. He's going to leave and just go out into the wild or whatever. Um, and, and, and find, and, you know, forge a new area, just live under the radar. That's, I think when the movie really kind of picks up, uh, for yeah, me. That, yeah, that would be, I guess, theoretically for going along this episode way, that would be episode two, right? When well, they finally make it to I the would, beach. I would say, I mean, I say one, maybe the first part's a pilot and this is like really where I would say that's where episode, episode one is them merging or, or like acclimating to the uh, water tribe. Um, episode two is the human um, spider with his recom like father, who's like his memories have been implanted in a Navi, right? Like warrior. And then three is the final scene uh, or like, you know, the, the big battle at the end. Yeah. Well, so either way, either way you like to slice it. Um, yeah. I just, I just think it's really fascinating because I've never seen, like uh, a deep dive study on like a fictional planet before, right? Because I would say that the the biggest example that we have of going to other planets is probably Star Wars, right? Mm-hmm. We have a whole lot of narrative and story out there of visiting other planets, but as everybody knows when it comes to Star Wars, all of these planets just end up being 
being a facsimile of a location, right? You know, you land on Endor, it's a forest planet. You land on Hoth, it's, it's just it's an ice planet. Defined by it, one geographical look, and that's yeah. really it, yeah. And it doesn't matter what side of the planet you're on, and the logistics of length of, of around a planet is never is never brought up, because theoretically these starships can just go out into orbit and go around, right? But in this movie, I thought it was really fascinating, because I was like, oh, his family's on the run, and I really felt like they were doing a good job hiding. They, they yeah. rode on those banshees for what seemed like days, yeah. and when they finally landed there, it was just like, oh, this is really cool. We're really seeing a different slice of Pandora we're seeing a different ecosystem and I also loved how they were visually evolved differently they yep. were evolved and ready to go for water and I love how they when they were getting roasted for having like thin arms and like weird like little tails Tail. I was like oh I never realized that these uh that our main characters were just really suitable and adapted to the forest yep. and then we're seeing these other and then as soon as I saw that I was like on board I was like all right give me more Navi I want to see sand Navi mm -hmm. I want to see Mountain Navi. I saw an, a headline just yesterday that said that uh, they might want to explore like a fire tribe for the yeah. Navi moving forward. So I, I want to see what that looks like. So I'm all on board to explore this planet for multiple movies. I want to see all of these different yeah. types of Navi because I just I think that's fascinating and that it, that really helped prepare propel the story, right? Yeah. Because that's what we were doing in the first film. We were following. Jake Sully adapting to the Navi and seeing their culture and understanding how it all works. And we kind of get to do that all over again. And it, it would, it would seem like a risk, right? You know, do you want to retread the same type of story? But I would say they did it and it was entertaining all over again. Cause it was a whole different type of acclimation, right? There was different like well, social structures yeah, going and, on there. So I just thought it was really cool. I, it, well, and I think the thing is also this movie is not about Jake Sully and Neytiri, right? This is not mm -hmm. about them. This is literally the movie about their kids. Uh, you know, they mm -hmm. have, they have three, three children. I'm going to try to say these um, out, out here. Let's see here. There's a uh, Loak who's the first or Neytayim is the first born Loke, who is the second son. And then they have a, um, daughter named uh, Took, uh, who's who's a younger younger girl. They've also adopted in um, uh, what, what I can't think of her name. Uh, Sigourney now. Weaver. Kiri. Uh, Kiri. Yes. Yeah. So Sigourney Weaver plays. Um, literally was motion cap for her quote unquote. The, I guess her um, avatar had an immaculate conception, and that that child is mocap by Sigourney Weaver again, which was really cool um, that they, they they pulled that through. Um, and then obviously spiders like their adopted um, human kid who's who's kind of raised with them. So yeah. I, you know, th but then we meet the water tribe kids, right? Like that, they're mm -hmm. the daughter and I guess the sons as well. And really, this movie is about them more than I think anything else. Um, for for most, I guess episode two and or I guess episode two here is all about that and them kind of learning to become part of the water tribe despite you know a lot of the. Um, you know, kids messing with each other for most of the movie. Yeah, and it was just, it, it was fun seeing them adapt to the the way of water. I was like, oh, that's the title of the movie. You said the title of the movie. They said it um, twice. But, they said it at the end, too. <laughs> yes, but it was just, it was fascinating to see something like that unfold. And also, um, I, I love the human technology elements of this because it, it, it's a good reminder that what we're watching is not necessarily a fantasy movie, At even though at times it does feel like that. This is has a hard like sci-fi element yeah. in it, right? Like I love like the futuristic whaling ship. What a, what a weird feeling the whaling uh, scene gives you in general, right? Because it, there is something like sadistic happening here. These humans are hunting down these creatures which have like super high intelligence, and they go out of the way to tell you that these whales are probably smarter than the humans. Yeah. They have culture, their family. They bring their kids back um, to show mm -hmm. the uh, the water tribe and it's like a very emotional feeling and then they show them just brutally uh, meticulously hunting one of them down but you're just so fascinated with it right because as mm. we were saying they have to they use those like water those in those inflated bags to raise the whales to the surface so they can't get away they have a tracer on them the freaking spider robots the crab robots mm -hmm. those things are so cool that is like the i would say 
quintessentially the coolest thing, if that could be a defined term, that I've seen on screen this year. They're just so cool looking. Like, I want a Lego of it, but I don't know how Lego releases a kit of something that's created to like kill whales right in this Mm -hmm. movie like i don't know how it's gonna happen like i was saying offline with you when we finished recording the podcast yesterday i was like oh maybe some of the navi can like capture some of these crab robots well, and repurpose I, I them so I can get yeah. a Lego kit for it because they're they're so cool the way they move in the water. But yeah. I was like, oh but they're they're tools of evil and oppression. I can't like yeah. them. So like I I love the sci fi so, elements. Like when we got to go briefly into space to see their drop ships and everything. Mm-hmm. So I love getting that. Like we get these two awesome sides of this world. We get to see the Navi connecting with these very specialized creatures. And then we get to see like these mechanical objects, like the new kind of bodysuits that they have now, to where you don't have to be in these gigantic, clunky mechs anymore. It's just kind of more like an exoskeleton that get, they get to wear. So yeah. just visually. There's always something new that you can just uh, get engrossed in. Yeah, I, I think the um, I, I had something I lost it, but like you know when, when we when we talk about this movie, I think you know in terms of story wise, I think you know we, we mentioned this on, earlier. I think for Zoe Saldana being one of the biggest characters, she literally takes the biggest back seat in this movie to to everybody mm-hmm. else. Um, but I'm also really you know. I applaud James Cameron for bringing back literally every actor from the first movie in some way uh, with like even the dead ones. He's like, yep, yeah, <laughs> we're bringing them back. Guess what? They're avatars this time. And I'm interested to see where that goes. Right. Um, we see uh, Quaritch be saved by his son who, you know, he, he saved him, but then like he leaves him. Like he's not with him on his side at the mm-hmm. end of the movie, but like, you know, he will be back, obviously, for another movie. Will he go back to the humans? Um, because, you know, he did, you know, he, he's kind of going against the humans. Will it be a personal vendetta against Jake Sully? You know, kind of kind of what's that look like? But um, I did enjoy, you know, Kate Winslet returning to, to be with James Cameron. She played Ronal, the, the, the uh, I guess, the queen of the Water Nation, if you didn't know that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the fun fact, uh, the, the king, uh, Tonawari, uh, it was played by Cliff Curtis, who was actually in Avatar, the last Airbender movie. He played the Fire Lord uh, in that movie. So in this <laughs> one, he's the Water Lord, if you will. So, um, yeah, overall, I, I mean, I really, I, I, I'm disappointed that, you know, the main characters, you know, that we know didn't get uh, some screen time. But I, I enjoyed the kids and, and everything there. I know what my question was, Mike. The You watched the first movie, like, a day before mm-hmm. you watched the second movie. Correct. Um, are these whales in the first movie? No, they're, they're not. But I believe, if, if I can remember the terminology correctly, there's like a classification of creatures on this planet that kind of reach almost like legendary Pokemon status. In in the first movie, it's that gigantic the banshee, orange banshee that, yeah. that Jake has to uh, tame in order to prove that he's worthy to kind of protect these Navi that don't trust him anymore after they feel like they've been double-crossed. So... I believe, I'm not 100% sure because it's really hard to keep track of these like new terms. Right. I think these whales kind of fall underneath maybe that classification. Like not all of them, but I felt like there was a bigger one compared to all the other ones. So I think well, that's kind of what happened. So, like they, they become so mythical. So here's what, I, so I rode Avatar's Flight of Passage uh, the, the, the two days after watching this movie, right, at Disney mm-hmm. World. In there, you go through the whole. Um, you're standing in line. You go through like some of the some abandoned RDA stuff. You get to see a, a recom in a tank. All this other fun stuff. When you ride the ride, though, have you have you been on the flight of passage? Before? No, they they don't have one out here. Okay, or in uh, California. So this this ride was open in 2017. In it, there is a water tribe and those big whales in it already. Um, so they've oh, had nice. those designed for you know just as long as they've been working on this movie. Um, so I, I thought that was very interesting to, it had, I, I've written this before and I didn't know, I, w- I would never have noticed it, but I was able to write it and see them. I'm like, Oh, my, my wife asked me, she's like, did they update it for the thing? I'm like, no, this is actually the original one. Still the same video. Uh, so I could totally see them updating it right for the new movie. But, um, but like they are literally, they have the, um, the water tribe and those big, the big whales, whatever they're called, um, out, out in the ocean while you're flying around, yeah. which I thought was really cool. 
Yeah, this would be a great time to go to your local library and see if they have the visual dictionary of any of the first movie or the second movie. I saw that there is one for sale. And I think I would love to flip through that just to get a little bit more familiar. But, but just to kind of like, yeah. to, I guess, wrap up the story in general, I think there's a lot of r- balls still left in the air that I'm looking forward to seeing how they um, how they wrap up. Uh, even though Natiri was a little bit of a backseat in this movie, she had, I think, one of the most interesting compelling moments in the entire movie between her and spider which i yeah. just thought was amazing because spider has never been around the navi in time in like times of peril right yeah. you know the kid was born you know after the humans were expelled or too young to remember and just grew up in times of peace and never kind of saw these navi as a threat he just saw them as family and then when he's on the boat and kind of hiding behind this little pillar he kind of sees natiri go a little savage yeah. like killing some of these um humans that have kidnapped her daughters and he's like terrified to come out from around this uh this uh Column. pillar yeah. because like he feels like if he was to turn around even though like like she has like gone feral in his eyes and he's terrified and i was like oh this is an interesting reminder for him that he is different. It doesn't mm. matter how much he is spending time with them. He'll, he's never going to be quite the same. And then when she uses him for leverage, I mean, like, wow, what a betrayal to just mm. like you've dedicated your entire life and now you've just been used as a pawn. So I thought that was a really powerful moment. And I was just like, OK, James Cameron does know how to do yeah. something like really um, just like really intricate to the story these like little moments that are huge these character moments mm-hmm. that you would think wouldn't appear in this big movie so i i think overall actually the more i talk about this movie the more i think i'm up and positive oh. on the story I, than, than i was before so well i think i think it's the, well, there's just a lot to digest i yeah. and i think it's in a good way yeah well i, th- I think we, you know, we we've talked about the, every you know episodes two and three but like again the whole movie is about children right the children of Jake, uh, Neytiri, and um, obviously Quaritch as well, which we didn't expect because, right, We I, I didn't know he had a kid in the first one. Did, did they say that mm. in the first movie? I don't think they did. No, no. I yeah. mean, but you could you could imagine it. I mean, people get down and dirty at military uh, well, bases uh, well, uh, far from yeah. home. Well, I'm not saying it's out there, but, like, you know, as, as like, hardcore military as he was in that, right? Like, I wouldn't mm-hmm. – yeah, they didn't, they didn't really touch on it. But, like, anyway, but I think, you know, we before we, we jump out of the story portion here, this last scene, the last – part of this movie the the last hour where the the boat comes they've tagged the whale that the the middle son has become you know i guess um a partner with right uh Mm -hmm. that's where this movie like really just kicks into gear right like we get to see all the we get to see the jake natiri we get to see the kids fighting we get to see hiding underwater this is where like you meant more of the crab you know tanks come out the ship's exploding it's capsizing he's doing titanic all over again but in sci-fi mode um, you know, it, there's a lot of, of really cool stuff in this and, uh, you, that, that, the, the whole scene at the end, um, the only thing I don't believe in, in, or I have the hardest time believing is like all these, like, I thought more people would drown in this movie and the way they, they painted, <laughs> but then on the same, like, well, they're not going to drown anybody. Right. I, I think they only killed the one son at the end of the day, like the oldest son dies. Um, but like, you know, everybody else is, uh. Nobody. I don't think anybody drowns, right? Like everybody makes it out. I mean, yeah, it was an impactful death. I was not expecting yeah. them to kill off like one of the sons. I mean, it just yeah. really goes to show it, you that nobody's safe in these movies, which I thought was good because we don't get a lot of that in our big franchise yeah. movies sometimes. That and plus a kid too to kill off right. a kid. And they, they like, tell, I mean, I, I I know they're like an older team, yeah. but like, still, like that's that's intense. So yeah. And and they uh, they telegraph it like like early on right with like the fake out of like you know when they're on the the banshees like doing watch out on some of those mm-hmm. runs, but like right it, it it was like something like yeah literally nobody's safe in this movie in the next movie or in the next three movies like they they don't need you know um, people to to be alive or they don't need or if they die they can literally find ways to bring them back as well so uh, it, it's gonna be surprising I think going forward for the story. I think it ends at a great spot, right? They've been accepted by the water people. They're going to fight off more humans. I'm interested to see where the humans go after this, right? The the RDA. Will Quaritch go back to them? Will they attack the water people? Or will they, you know, will they go after, like you mentioned, another quote-unquote tribe? And they all have to go save another tribe, right? Like, yeah, maybe my, they're attacking my... the fire tribe. Now they have to go find the fire tribe and help them. Yeah. 
uh, my, my theory is that uh, Jake is going to do a tour around Pandora to try to unite all of the tribes and convince them that nothing's going to stop these humans. And uh, mm-hmm. the big tonal shift we got from the humans in this movie is that Earth is destroyed. It's depleted. There's yep. nothing left there. They need a new home. That is the orders kind of for the military branch that's here yeah. on this planet. In the first movie, it was more like a strip mine operation. Let's just get what we can from this planet and get back to Earth and use this unobtainium and get rich. Now it's more like, oh, Pandora is our only hope. And I feel like in the next movie or them moving forward, it's going to be the last it's going to be the last ship arriving, right? The the big fleet that's going to arrive is going to be like, this is it. This is all of our humans. There's mm-hmm. no more left. There's no well, more coming. If- Earth is destroyed. So it's going to be more like we're here permanently. It's either us or you. There's an all-out I, fight. There's there's no more running them off the planet because there's nowhere else for them to go I, is going to be my guess. Well, that's going to go against your idea of them going back to Earth then because – if there's well there. yeah i mean earth is still there it didn't yeah. get exploded I, by the death star but like i don't yeah, think it's gonna be i don't think the next slow one's phase out it's a slow yeah. phase out process right you move to a new office you still yeah. got you still got the lease on the old one yeah. it's really shitty but you still left some I, stuff there you know i think i don't think they'll all do i i think the other thing they're gonna have to do the i guess the uh navi are going to have to get i guess maybe technical is my thought theory like right like they have to progress their culture a little farther forward um, because they're getting beat down by like all the technology, right? And they can't go to space to to stop them from coming into the atmosphere. So I think they're going to have to commandeer a lot of human tech and start fighting back in that regard. But I don't know how they're going to do that uh, to 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 get them. I guess, like you mentioned, out of like the savagery and into like yeah. maybe the Middle Ages Man. a little bit more, like the Steel Era. So, Man, there, like, there is so much more to this movie than I thought before I started um, talking about it with you. There, like, there, there are so many little things I could, I could bring mm. up. Like, right, we could talk about them looting these different types of trains. The, the brief mm. shot that we have of this new city that's being built on the planet from the humans that's way bigger than the little outpost that they had from the first movie. There's, there's so many new things that we could bring yeah. up, but like I, I think that you, the best thing that I could uh, suggest is that you subscribe to our normal uh, weekly news podcast. And mm-hmm. I'm sure over the weeks we'll talk more and more about story yeah. elements as we get rumors of what's going to be coming in these next movies. But I, I think now we got we got to talk about the, yes. the technologic so, side of this thing. It is just an absolute yeah. wonder, and there is not a single bad thing I think I could say from the technical side. I, of the filmmaking of this movie, except maybe trying to get used to this possibility of introducing variable frame rates. Yes, that's exactly my, what I was going to say. Into, so into my narrative, I I don't know how I feel about it yet. So to me, and uh, you know, this is something you know we we talk about. You know, the idea of resourcing like Pandora, right? Humans and Navi. I mentioned what if we did like a Civilization or like you know a World of Warcraft style game with the Navi and the humans? Like that would be a fantastic goddamn video game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, top down RTS style. But you know, at the same time, there were a lot of scenes in this movie, and I told you this yesterday, where it felt like oh, the frame rates ramped up. I'm about to go from like wide camera angle to over the shoulder of one of these characters and I have to control them around the, the, the world a little bit because the variable frame matches kind of like that higher 60 frames per second that they do in video games but as you mentioned it's not consistent right the whole movie is at one frame rate they ramp it up during action scenes or other things to kind of to highlight um different areas of the scenes or like to make you feel yeah. a certain way while you're watching it. But also I would say it's almost more loosey goosey than that in a way of like the best analog I could think of. Like if you remember watching Nolan Batman movies back in the day on the IMAX screen, whenever the big action set piece would happen, right? You would see the aspect ratio of the screen change and you go, Oh, this was the portion of the film that was filmed at IMAX. I see that the aspect ratio has changed. Let's settle in for this action scene. Right. But in this movie, uh, I, I felt like the frame rate was kind of all over the place. Like sometimes I'd be in an action scene and it'd be a high frame rate. Yes. And sometimes it would just be in the interior of like a science lab and they would just be kind of like jumping around tables, like, and they would just be having like a conversation and the frame rate would be higher. So like, it almost felt like I was like, like being eased in and out of these different frame rates. And I was like, what is happening? Mm-hmm. And yep. I felt like I was distracted by just trying to figure out what was happening here. And my only assumption, 
vision is that like Cameron comes at it from an angle of like whenever we're just doing kind of like over the shoulder um just uh dialogue scenes from uh going like shot reverse shot we're just going to stick to the normal filmic uh you know frame rate that we're used to but whenever we're seeing like dynamic motion whether it's an action scene or just just a character interesting going from one end of the room to the other i'm going to crank up the frame rate and i wonder if it if it's going from 24 frames a second and then like up to 60 or is it like sometimes is it 24 then it's, it goes so, to 30 maybe 48 and then 60 like is there like a range that he's fluctuating yeah, so, through so it's not james well, it is james cameron but there's a company called pixel works which did this all um, they did all the the um the, the the actual framing like the frame rates of this so there are 24 and 48 but they literally do it on a shot by shot basis. Like there is like they don't highlight an area and say this scene, you know, in the lab is going to be forty eight. The next scene's twenty four. They were doing it for, like literally almost shot by shot in the movie, uh, twenty four forty eight, based on what they felt was the cinematic appeal for the yeah. film. Um, yeah, and I guess you could do that if you if you film your entire film at a high frame rate, similar to how if you fill. Your, film your entire film at like a high resolution like 8k cameras right yeah. you know you can crop and adjust any scene that you want so yeah I, I guess it almost like i almost like imagine like a slider right like somebody's watching the movie like oh this is intense let's increase the frame rate oh let's bring it back down yeah. let's bring it up let's bring it down and it feels very fluid like i feel like i just can't see the lines always yeah and, and frame rate does go along again one thing i've ever learned about frame rate is if you when you do your audio, it has to match your frame rate. So they have to record it at one way and then make sure it samples downwards in mm. in the proper way. But like I, the only scene I can remember the most that had the high frame rate was like when the boat hits a rock and this person literally went flying out of it. Like, right. Like he was doing a cartwheel. Mm -hmm. I could see everything, the whole, every frame he did in like full 48 frames as his body was like being hurtled into the ocean um, for, for this scene. Um, yeah, I know there were more, but like that's one that sticks out to me. Cause I'm like, Whoa, that looks like a video game cutscene. Um, so it was just, it was kind of fun to see it. I don't think every movie needs this, right? I think this movie, you know, knowing that we're watching a technical, we know we're watching a technical Marvel. It's not like a guesswork. We're not being, it's not unveiling itself to us as we watch. We know what we were getting into going into this. But it's interesting to, to know they've, they've played a little bit more with this. Not a consistent frame rate, but the variable frame rate, like you mentioned. Like, The Hobbit takes a little bit to get... Like, I watched the first one in 48, and it took a minute to get used to, right? Because all the trailers were at 24, and then the movie was at 48, and you're like, I'm, I feel motion sick. I feel, I feel really motion sick. And I think you mentioned your wife got motion sick as well for some of it, because... Um, you know, she, she's yeah, like me. The, we, was, we get motions pretty was, easy. I mean, and I would and I would say it was an effective scene though yeah. because it was when they were in that zero gravity kind of like birthing pod in yeah. orbit, and the camera's going all over. She was like, "Whoa!" I mean, I could feel it a little bit, but I, I I'm I'm not that motion sickness. But it it yeah. was it was happening for sure yeah. on her end, which I was just like, "Well, this is effective." I mean, I suppose yeah. you would be a little disoriented if you were up there in space. So I do Absolutely. feel like I'm in a unique place <laughs> yeah absolutely and, and i i don't i i like I, said, I just don't think i don't think we need to see you know the next quentin tarantino movie in in variable frame rate but like you know watching something like this is definitely uh it was fun it was, it was fun to see it now uh some of some of the other things i was gonna you know we talked about one of the scenes you mentioned in the trailer early on was where that the person's hand is in the water um mm -hmm. they did they did un, i don't know if you saw they did uncover how they did that that oh my it, gosh, that that scene has been analyzed yeah. like six ways to Sunday yeah. out there on the internet. Yeah, there there is a physical prop out there, uh, but they did it know, in the water and then they overlaid everything on top of it. Yeah, 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 but who knows? I mean, you're never. I don't. I don't think we're ever going to really know where CG starts and practical ends in this movie, right? You know, are are we talking like you know the new CG Lion King where it pretty mm. much is an entirely an animated movie? You know, how yep. much is this actual real physical? You know, because all of this is like mo-capped, right? So this is in a sound stage where we're getting a lot of the mo-capped data. Yeah. You know, well, so did, there, I'm sure there's parts of it, but I would, I, if I had to guess, I would guess the majority of this movie, which means over 50% of the pixels on the screen are uh, computer generated. Well, they've been, they've been touched. I, I'd say a lot of it has been touched because one thing, you know, I, there was a video this weekend I watched you know, behind the scenes that did show like they were in the water for that, right? Like, they have physical props, but like the backgrounds are 
like obviously aren't real but a lot of the actors they wore fake dreadlocks um for their scenes like they like bright color like dreads on their hair so they could feel how their hair was reacting and react to that like in the movie right because that's one mm-hmm. thing like sometimes you don't think about the weight of 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 hair especially because everyone in this has awful dreadlocks um i'm just gonna go ahead and say that um uh for this but like you know they they actually made the actors wore that on top of their mocap suits like those dreadlocks so they could see how they the hair reacted to their body moving uh one of the things i thought was cool about the navi is like again um their ears like the way the ears move more than like they're, when they're they're talking and you can see the emotion not just off their body but like how their ears move right like when they're angry or like oh, yeah. perked up and I, mean, I thought it was really it's like small details like that really go a yeah, long way j- just speaking of the navi in general i i was totally in disbelief that these like weren't real creatures right i just felt like if i walked out of the movie theater i could just see like a 10 foot navi just out in the lobby and i would be like oh yeah this makes sense i just saw the movie that you were uh that you were cast in right it's just so believable i mean the fidelity and the resolution of the pores on the skin it, it was just so lifelike the animations and that's really what sells it too, like the, the motion capture. Yep. And I'm sure that there's fine tuning animation from animators as well. Like it just all felt so real. <laughs> like I felt like I was on an alien planet. Mm-hmm. It was just, yeah. it was just yeah. absolutely fascinating. I've just never seen visually a movie but, go so hard. Right. <laughs> I, I would say my, my biggest ding against this movie is going to be a, a, a creative decision. And that is knowing that we have, um, Sigourney Weaver uh, play a young actress and use her voice as well. Um, yeah. Hearing I... Sigourney Weaver's voice, knowing it's her, knowing her age, and then seeing her play a young Kiri, to me broke a, broke me a little bit. Like not enough to ruin the movie, but like I feel like they they could have touched that maybe a little bit more. Um, well, like for I, that. I could feel like you could. I feel like you could feel the modulation, right? right yeah. Like Sigourney Weaver has a very identifiable voice, especially if you just rewatched the very first Avatar movie. You're very familiar with what she sounds yeah. like, and, and she's and then, in this with her voice too. The, you know, the, yeah. the, the scenes though. Yeah, and then obviously, I'm sure they tried to just plug her voice as it is onto this younger character, and they're like, oh, you know, it's not working. You know, we tried it, we didn't think it was going to work, so now let's like modulate it a little bit. And just sometimes it felt like I was hearing Sigourney Weaver coming out of this character. Sometimes yeah. I felt like I was hearing the computer version come out of this character. So it, yeah, I would I would agree it was a little jarring it, of just like. What, what's happening? <laughs> and, and it's, I, you know, it, it, that is, I, I, I love the idea of using Sigourney Weaver to play a younger version of herself, right? This immaculate mm-hmm. conception person who has this um, connection with, uh, is it Awa? I believe is their, their god yeah. of this planet. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, this obviously, she's obviously supposed to be like Pandora Jesus is, is how this is going to play out later, right? Like she's got some extra spiritual connection, but like, I, I think that's great coming from Sigourney Weaver who had that connection in her avatar body, but like, the voice was just the uh, again. It's not enough to like. I have to nitpick to find this right, but like that mm-hmm. was like the only thing I was like, uh, not the not the best thing, but like you know everything else really. Again, the actors, the everything really brought me into. It. I didn't see as much Stephen Lang in in in, in the Quaritch recom as I thought I would, but he still did a great job. Like you know, Stephen Lang's just got that menacing military voice to him. Um, you know, you just you just hear that that prick in his voice and that. I, I like it. I, I didn't see as much in him, and that's not a complaint. I'm like, I'm glad they they didn't make him like one for one from like his military version, right? And give him, like we gave you the same scar your your other person had, so you remember the scars you had. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I mean, I, th- I think it was it was a good time. I mean, I like visually, like all the all the avatars. Um, I I also forgot the one thing I didn't get in my recap video. I forgot the five and four finger thing or the four five and six mm-hmm. finger thing. Um, did that play a big? roll on the first one or was that just a no not really because no one was really going a hundred percent undercover in the first movie uh the navi knew that the humans were there uh they knew uh jake sully was kind of like this hybrid but yeah. you know believed that he truly wanted to learn and adapt so they let him be a part of the navi you know almost you could say there's a theme going here where james cameron wants you to know that like the navi are just better 
it's just a better society, mm-hmm. right? Than than the human race, right? Where you can go, you can be a hybrid, you can be like a mutant or like a quote or a freak or whatever. And yeah, teenagers will still bully you because teenagers are the same across the galaxy. They will yeah. always be me, no matter what. But the adults were just like, no, you you need help. You're a part of this planet. We're we're here to help you. Open arms, even when like the threat of bringing the war to them was very apparent. They were just like no we're yeah. we're here to help you like e- even though this is a lot of strife you know we are we are all one we are all part of this planet and i, I think that's really strong and that's going to be the x factor yeah. you know that helps them defeat the humans at the end of the day it's kind of like that that uh, that that tried and true uh story that you hear in every movie of just like we're going to defeat you because we have friendship yeah. but it's going to be we're going to defeat you because my tele kinetic daughter adopted daughter can control the vines across the planet and it's going to use these huge tree trunks to like whip your you know helicopters out of yeah, the sky in the fifth movie that's i think <laughs> you know um i don't know i'm gonna i'm gonna pull this up real fast so like the um i i really enjoy all the creatures in this right the designs mm-hmm. and things like they're alien but they're also familiar you know kind of kind of in yeah. this world um, yeah, it's not – they're not too crazy kooky that you can't believe that, you know, life could have evolved that way. You know, they just look similar enough in the way. Even, like, when the uh, water banshees – I don't remember what names they were. When they would glide through the water, their tails would move back and forth as kind of like a fin – even though they were like gliding above the water and I was like, Oh, that's really, really cool. That makes a lot. That's, that is a, a way that they would traverse. And I could see that happening like, you know, on yeah. our planet as well. Okay. So everything was just so believable. So here, here it is. So, um, in 20, I believe 19, 2018, the titles for avatar two, three, and four and five were leaked. Um, mm-hmm. The the sequel for Avatar two they said was the way of water in twenty nine okay. twenty eighteen so they they got that right right so here is the next three movie titles Mike All right, and, and let, let's let's see how, Avatar the Seed Bearer okay Av, Avatar the Tolkien Rider and Tolkien's are the big water um the the big elephants that they were hunting like okay sea 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 whales and then Avatar the Quest for Awa. Which... Oh, okay. So that that that's one thing that's that's interesting, right? Because at the end of this movie, uh, Jake Sully kind of makes it makes doubles down on this idea that like, oh, we are sea people now. This is our home. We're not going anywhere, audience. We will yeah. be here for the next like so... three movies, which kind of felt interesting because I, I still think we're gonna get broad. We're gonna see more of the planet uh, for sure. Yeah. But it is interesting that like, okay, this is kind of where they're uh, like, you know, putting but down their. They don't roots. need. Yeah, if they did the third movie and the third movie was literally the same thing, oh, we're gonna we gotta leave the water nation and go meet the <laughs> air people or whatever, and you're like, they're just gonna do the whole thing again. I think mm-hmm. I think it's I think that would be sucked. But knowing that they filmed two and three back to back, keeping these actors the same age, I think that's a fantastic idea. Because I think if these people aged up, they'd have to keep moving the story forward, right? Like quite a bit. Um, so yeah, knowing that the next one is called the the Seed Bearer, you know what what visuals you know do you think is is this going to be more of the like there, there's big spirit trees, right? They have one underwater here. They have yeah. one that was destroyed in the first movie. Maybe that maybe this seed is destined to grow into a big tree that will help protect them from the human invasion, mm-hmm. and they gotta hunt down the seed. And I do know I don't know why I remember this, um, but there is like a, a one of the reasons that like forests regrow after they're like burned cast burned is that there's a lot of seeds like i think like pine trees they're seeds that won't open unless they like catch on fire they need the heat in order to reopen so if if there's rumors that there's going to be fire avatar in the next one you know maybe that could be maybe there could be a little bit of a thematic uh connection there yeah Uh, but man i am i am all on board for this man if you flashback listen to some of our episodes right when they were when they were reigniting the avatar franchise and they were going to be making all these movies oh man I mean, we, we well, you could say that we're eating crow. I don't yeah. know if it's a huge crow feast, but the, we were just like, who needs more of these movies, Cameron? It's been yeah, too long. The, Move on to something else. And it's just like, man, he did it. I'm, I'm all in. <laughs> well, the problem I don't think is the movies. The problem is James Cameron's personality, where he's just 
just he he sounds egomaniacal in his interviews. Oh, he's like I, he's like, well, I, I'm gonna I, do I is like the best thing. It's not him. I don't think his movies I have a problem with is him. So I'm like, well, if you just just maintain this, and I'll be fine with whatever you put out. Just don't let yeah, it go to your head. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't really want to get coffee with the guy. He doesn't yeah. seem like he's like super chill, right? He seems like he's really hardcore. He's like kind of like the uncle that you see at the holidays and all he wants to talk about is like, you know, the ocean, right? Like and he, he move, maneuvers every conversation to the time he went out in a submarine or something like that. It's like, okay, I get it, Uncle James. You're really yeah. into this, but I'd love to talk about something so, else. <laughs> yeah. The the other thing they did mention in an interview this week, uh, you know, the, the producer, and James Cameron is they don't need to do this every year, right? They they've already filmed the third one, but they can work on this visually and oh, story wise for please. for a little bit. Wow! So like, I would I would love this to be like a an every other year type of thing. Yeah, I I don't I don't need to do this every year. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I'm thinking. Like, hopefully, you know, four and five don't take the ten years break right after three mm -hmm. if they're gonna do them. If they do with three, even better. In with three. But I know that they filmed the, the start of four with the kids while they were young. And then they're like, okay, well, when you come back, we're going to age you up. That's fine. But, like, I don't want a 10-year wait. Like, let's let's do every two years and then maybe three years for four and another two for five. Like, and then, and then get on. What I would like to see, um, you know, talking about how the world has been built is, you know, again, you mentioned a visual guide. I would love some individual, maybe some 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 novels, maybe some comic books set in this world, Ooh, right? Yeah. To kind of flesh it out a little bit more. I, I think there's a lot to be explored. Now, will Cameron license those out? I don't know. Um, you know, I know oh, he's yeah, licensed can, Terminator out, but... Oh, like, yeah, you know Disney Plus is chomping at the bit to get some sort of series out of this. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's back on Earth. Maybe it's a prequel in some way, but just to get a a weekly avatar out there for, you know, for yeah. eight weeks in a row, that would be huge for them. But yeah, James Cameron seems like a guy that wants to keep this locked down, but, um, yeah, I could see yeah. that happening, uh, for yeah. sure. Some sort of offshoot, the, uh, maybe an yeah. anime adaptation of something, you know, Netflix is yeah. known to do that a lot. Yeah. Like, like they could do stories, historical stories on Pandora animated, right. And, and be mm -hmm. cheaper than trying to CGI <laughs> the, the avatars for that. The last thing I want to ask for you, I, I have an idea that the you know Avatar movies are known for being technological advancements, right? For for mm -hmm. everybody, what is your idea for the next? If for Avatar three, it's got to do something new, right? Not just variable yeah. frame rate. What is the next big technological thing? Do you think Avatar three will have, or you well, would like to see? Well, heck, he talked about this technology of glasses. Uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, I don't. So. I don't know how you pull that off i don't understand the technology of that I, I don't know how that works but if somehow that's a possibility of i don't know what you do put a gigantic nintendo 3ds up on the screen like and you like restrict people from sitting on the edges of the aisles I, I don't know how that works but i'd love to see that implemented in some way uh but honestly i would be totally fine if he just kept refining what he had right mm -hmm. you know if i got more of this for three more movies you know, i'll keep going back to the imax screen as much as i hated trying to get in and out of those aisles i'll, I'll go back and try to see get it an aisle seat screen yeah may, yeah maybe maybe that's the the, the goal but <laughs> Yeah, overall, the uh, Chris, the more and more we talked about this, the more enthralled oh. I got with it. I, I, I think this world is really yeah. fun and really creative. Uh, I, I, there are definitely places to improve on the story, but I can't lie and say I wasn't engrossed every second of this film. So I, I don't think we can discount that visuals are sometimes can be just as important as the, as the story you know james cameron definitely thinks so and he he kept me busy for three over three hours so yeah surprise we have a new addition to the superhero slate podcast where we love tv movies superheroes and avatars or navi or yeah we love pandora <laughs> i don't know well, if we add that to the top of the show but i think it's safe to say that this is i we're gonna we're gonna put this in the rotation when we get new yeah. news on avatar we'll talk about it yeah and we kind of always have the thing i'm looking for here is um we do know that there was an avatar video game announced like mm -hmm. a couple years ago and that's like the next thing i only like that's the thing i'm looking forward to next not just you know i know avatar 3 is coming but i know we're going to be they're not going to show anything off until like what, two or three months beforehand. Um, but like, I, I would love to again, revisit Pandora in a video game format in, in that interim. Mm -hmm. So if we get any information on that, I know there was a game that came in 2009, but that's not what I'm thinking about. 
So um, we'll we'll keep you guys posted. But um, there's anything else, Mike? I think I think that's it. That's our brief. This is only a third of the time it took to watch Avatar, by the way. Um, so <laughs> I, I feel pretty confident there. If, if people want to know what you're up to, what you're doing, where can they find you at, my friend? Oh, they can find me at Mike Royer Design on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. You can read my web comics at pickledcomics.com. Chris, if people want to catch up with you, where can they find you? Yeah, you can find me on um, Instagram, Valdan87. I'm going to put my um, – I talked about my Disney stuff. I didn't get time today, but I'm going to put up the Avatar uh, Land Pandora uh, from Disney uh, stuff on there. So I'm going to get that up there. Uh, you guys can check out some of that. If people know more about the show, our regularly scheduled episode that we do, where can they find all that good information at? Yes, we've been doing this solidly uh, for eight plus years now, going into our ninth year. So you can find everything that we've done over at superhero slate dot com that is the best place to find our upcoming releases page so if you want to see the next movie that we're going to be reviewing which i believe is ant-man quantum mania uh you can find that on our upcoming release calendar uh you can find us on apple Podcasts, youtube spotify wherever else you love to listen to find podcasts like us on facebook follow us on twitter and instagram and you can get merch at superhero slate.com slash store we love hearing from you what did you think of avatar the way of water uh did you did you love it did you yeah. hate it do you want to see more of it? Are you excited for the next one? How many more movies do you think they need? Do you think there's enough content there for a streaming show? Let us know. Reach out. We love our super fans. So if you want to be a super fan of this show, all you got to do is paint yourself blue, share the show with a friend, share the mm-hmm. show with a buddy, and we'll be here every week, folks. That's right. We will see you guys next week. Bye. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe.